After the Second World War, the political spectrum in the Western world began to undergo significant shifts in thinking as the right and the left adjusted to the emerging post-war liberal consensus. In 1950s America, a new left began to emerge, cynical about orthodox Marxism due to the grim nature of the Soviet Union. The new left began to focus their criticism on the stultifying culture of post-war America. Chief among these critics were the Frankfurt School, a group of intellectuals banished from Nazi Germany who were welcomed in the United States. Frankfurt School theorists combined Freudian psychoanalysis with Marxism to produce new critiques of American capitalism that went beyond the economic. In his seminal book One Dimensional Man, Herbert Marcuse writes of the flattening of discourse, imagination and culture produced by the dominant order. As the new left became cynical about the authoritarian nature of the communist experiment in the Soviet Union, and traumatised by the rise of fascism in Europe, they became focused on authoritarianism. Theodore Adorno published The Authoritarian Personality in 1950, which sought to define personality traits which, when ranked in intensity, could place any person on a so-called F scale, the F standing for fascism. Another trend of the emerging new left was an abandonment of orthodox Marxism, with its heavy focus on economic determinism, in favour of a focus on revolutionising society through culture. At the same time, they became sceptical of the revolutionary potential of the industrial proletariat of the West and began to focus on uniting disparate grievance groups like black nationalists, feminists and gay rights activists against the established social order. At the same time, there was a growing conservative reaction against the established cosmopolitan culture. The post-war conservative revival was kicked off in Britain with the publication of The Road to Serfdom in 1944, Friedrich von Hayek's principled attack on collectivism, which became a major event in American intellectual life when it was published in that country. Hayek was heavily influenced by his mentor, the economist Ludwig von Mises, an Austrian Jew who emigrated to the United States in the 1940s. In the 1950s, Whitaker Chambers, along with social critics James Burnham and Frank Meyer, spearheaded the growth of a militant and evangelistic anti-communism. In their view, the West was engaged in a life and death struggle with an equally zealous Soviet Union, and a militant anti-communism was necessary if the West was to come out victorious. At the same time as an intellectual conservative movement was emerging, church membership had soared in the 1950s. And a high point for conservatism came with the appearance of Russell Kirk's The Conservative Mind, From Burke to Santayana, which was published in 1953. Kirk harkens back to the traditional conservatism of Edmund Burke, with his focus on the wisdom of tradition, order and gradual reform over abstract political ideals or revolutionary political programs. Kirk surveys conservative thought from Burke to the time of his writing, to show a consistent intellectual conservatism that prizes a belief in divine intent, tradition, natural law, hierarchy, the inseparability of property and freedom, and scepticism of utopian political programs. We can see how far Kirk's traditional conservatism is from the modern form of conservatism with its slavish adherence to free market ideology and worship of capitalism in his essay The Chirping Secretaries, which was a direct attack on libertarian ideology. In this essay, Kirk writes that what conservatives and libertarians share is that, quote, they set their faces against the totalist state and the heavy hand of bureaucracy. He then asks, what else do conservatives and libertarians profess in common? The answer to that question is simple, nothing, nor will they ever have. To talk of forming a league or coalition between these two is like advocating a union of fire and ice. The ruinous failing of the ideologues who call themselves libertarians is their fanatic attachment to a simple solitary principle, that is, to the notion of personal freedom as the whole end of civic social order, and indeed of human existence. The libertarians are old-fangled folk, in the sense that they live by certain abstractions of the 19th century, that carry to absurdity the doctrines of John Stuart Mill. According to Kirk, libertarians and conservatives disagree in that Firstly, the libertarian takes the state for the great oppressor, while the conservative finds that the state is ordained by God. And secondly, the libertarian thinks that the world is chiefly a stage for the swaggering ego, 
The conservative finds himself instead a pilgrim in a realm of mystery and wonder, where duty, discipline and sacrifice are required, and where the reward is that love which passeth all understanding. The rising conservative movement was eventually brought together by William F. Buckley in 1955 with the creation of the National Review. Although Kirk contributed to the National Review, he never appeared on the masthead. He chided Buckley when National Review failed to review his books, and he was later vilified by the senior editor, Frank Meyer. Kirk's brand of traditionalism outlined above never really matched with the new conservatism being promoted by the editors of the National Review. Now, Buckley had previously spied for the FBI in his time studying in Yale, and he came to prominence at a young age when he wrote the book God and Man at Yale, which criticised the liberal, secular, Keynesian consensus that was forced on students by academics. In the book The Neoconservative Revolution, Jewish Intellectuals and the Shaping of Public Policy by Murray Friedman, he writes that, quote, National Review was attractive and crisply edited, enhancing the message of the new conservatism. Buckley sought to distinguish the publication from the irresponsible right. With his later celebrity status as a television star, through the firing line, the suave and sophisticated Buckley put conservatism on the map. In the absence of National Review or some similar publication, there would probably have been no serious and popular intellectual force on the right in the 1960s and 1970s. With the impact of National Review and later his TV show The Firing Line, Buckley was probably more responsible than anyone for the conservative takeover of the Republican Party in the mid-20th century, and later, the Reagan Revolution. The most dangerous man in America is going to lecture at the Yale Law School. His name is William F. Buckley, Jr. So, of course, I went, thinking I was going to see you know, the successor to Jesse James. It would be fair to say that Ronald Reagan rode to victory on a political philosophy that Bill Buckley's been offering up for more than two decades. Without Bill Buckley, no National Review. Without no National Review, no Goldwater nomination. Without the Goldwater nomination, no conservative takeover of the Republican Party. Without that, no Reagan. Without Reagan, no victory in the Cold War. Therefore, Bill Buckley won the Cold War. You didn't just part the Red Sea. You rolled it back, dried it up, and left exposed for all the world to see the naked desert that is statism. And you did it without an environmental impact statement. I want to thank you for leaving us a magazine and a group of thinkers that will help make the advance of liberty over the last 50 years look like a dress rehearsal for the next 50 years. The full 27-minute uncensored version of this video is available on Odyssey. I discuss the hidden forces behind the creation of what is known today as conservatism, who William F. Buckley was really representing, and how the creation of National Review went right to the top of the U.S. deep state. The link to the full video is in the description.